Amen. At the same time, though, I am very excited. Amen. I even thought about um, because I'm staying in Riverside, so I thought about uh, like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna end up, you know, just get somebody else to teach me. And I thought about that. I'm like, yeah, that's not a good idea. I, that's not a good idea. Why? Because I enjoy the people of God. I, I used to think pastors said that, you know, just to say that as a formality. But no, I really do enjoy the people of God. Amen. I enjoy the things that God has for us. I enjoy being used as a vessel because what I'm finding out is even at my age, amen, is that a lot of people aren't being used by God because they got other things on their mind. But I have Christ on my mind. You all have Christ on your mind. People who are watching on Facebook, they got Christ on their mind. YouTube got Christ on your mind. Why? Because in this perilous day and time, what else would you want to have on your mind besides Christ? And so we're, we're going to talk about today, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. We're going to be talking about dead man walking. Amen. And well, let's go to our foundational scripture. It is Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. When you have it, say amen. Amen. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It is after the book of Acts, right before 1 Corinthians. Right after Romans chapter 5, but right before Romans chapter 7. Verse 23. Right after verse 22. And right before verse 24. So by now we should all be there. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And it reads as such. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is nothing that we can obtain in this life without Jesus Christ. But some of us, some of us Christians, some of us non-Christians, atheists and any other kind of believer sometimes we just want to take Jesus for granted the day that you wake up and Jesus is not the first thing on your mind you potentially could waste your day without Jesus being your priority you know how I know that's an important fact because none of us that have jobs wake up in the morning and say I'm not going to my job because it's not a priority before you do that, you will call in sick. You will take a vacation day. Why is that? Because you understand the importance of the job is that you get paid. And people like to get paid. People get paid whatever your salary may be. And so it's the same thing with Jesus Christ. Only thing about Christ, though, is Christ does not be pay, doesn't pay you with physical money. Christ pays you with blessings. Christ pays you because if you are sincere to him, he will be sincere to you. Uh, I can not make this up. The scripture says if you draw nigh unto Christ, he will what? Draw nigh unto you. So this is, should be our first priority every morning that we wake up, thinking about drawing nigh unto Christ. But most of us are dead men walking. Why? Because for the wages of sin is death. Some of us, we commit sins uh, and don't even realize we're committing sins. Some of us, we so bold, we know we're doing wrong, and we still don't ask for repentance. Then we have the group of holy rollers. What do I call a holy roller? I do not call the holy rollers the ones that roll on the floor. I mean, granted, I may not roll on the floor, but that does not mean if someone else roll on the floor, they are wrong. What do I call a holy roller? The holy roller is that person, that man, that woman who turned their nose up at everybody else. It's me and my world, and you have nothing. It's that person who does not commit sin. It's that person who get high-minded. It's that person who thinks of themselves more highly than they ought. They get up and they have a what they call a braggadocious spirit. God forbid. God said we should always stay humble in his eyesight. 
the greatest men and the greatest women that God ever used were men and women who was humble before him. And so we're going to talk about the part two of this. We're going to talk about those of us that don't drink no more. Don't cheat on their wives anymore. Don't lie. Don't cheat on their taxes. You know, there's a certain amount of self-righteousness that comes with that. Because you think you got it all together. Because based on the religious dogma or based on the, the religious standards that is set today, you can walk around with your chest stuck out. But I'm here to tell you, if you think that way, feel that way, you are no different than the Pharisees. Because they say they kept the law blameless. And God still found fault in them. Why? Because they kept it from a physical standpoint. Let us go in our Bibles. Let us go to, um, let's go to Romans. Let us go to Romans. Romans chapter 14. When you have it, say amen. It says, have thou faith. Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. He that is he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith. stop right there because here's what I want to point out to you because if you're looking at Romans chapter 14 they had this big thing if you read above those scriptures if you read above those scriptures what you're going to see is they had a big argument about eating and drinking about eating meats and drinking and so what I'm here to tell you about is this it doesn't really matter what someone else believes other people's beliefs is totally irrelevant to how you live your life. And this is why most of us as Christians, we fail. Because we feel like we have to lower our standards to do what? Meet their standards. That's why the first thing he said is, do you have faith? Because if you read prior, what does he say? He says, let us therefore, in verse 19, let us therefore follow the things that make peace. You know what we consider making peace most of the time? If I do what the world do. If I don't say nothing, if I, if they want me to do something that is against my principles. I remember when I was in the Navy and I was going through chief induction. And then one of the things that they had, they had this drinking station. And so they was like, in order for you, you know, to make it to this part, you know, because we had made it through the majority of the induction. And they said, you know, you had to drink this beer. But it's just only one glass of beer. You know, they were trying to get us drunk. They just drink this one glass of beer. And uh, everybody drunk that one glass of beer. Except for me. Yeah, I didn't drink that beer. Oh, they rolled me hard. They was trying to say, well, you know, you think you're a goody two-shoes. Where does it in the Bible that it says that you can't drink? I said, y'all wasting y'all time. <laughs> I said, yeah, I, you can say what you want to say about me. Why? Because I, I'm, I don't drink. That's not in me to drink. For me to drink, it's a sin. And that's what I told him. I said, yeah, I ain't telling you. Look, I ain't condemning nobody in here. And they said, well, what does it say it's a sin? I say, it's a sin to me because if I go against my own principles. Notice how I put that. If I go against my own principles, that's sin. That's where sin comes in at. Because there are principles that are on the inside of you. I'm not saying I would have sinned if I would have drunk that beer. I'm not saying that. But if there's not any other time in my life that I'm going to drink that beer, why would I dress, settle to drink for it right now? Yes, why would I do that? That's a good. Now, if I had, you know, 
if I, you know, had a beer at home or in the refrigerator, then I probably would have did it. But there's no other area at no time in my life was I going to ever drink a beer. So for me to yield right now to that pressure would have been wrong. It was just like when they made it to the end. Everybody got a stogie. They smoke. You know I ain't drank smoking that. We know. We know. <laughs> and they told me, if you don't do this, you're not going to make it past induction. I said, I can wait it out. I said, because two things are going to happen. Either A, I'm going to get paid first. Because no matter how long you keep me here, I'm going to get paid on the 15th. So I'm okay with that. Or two, you're going to give out waiting. Because my stamina is just as long as yours. That's called standing up for your principle. But what I want you to pay attention to is not that I didn't do it. I didn't condemn them. See, the problem we have as Christians is we condemn people who don't think the way we think, talk the way they talk. We condemn them. And once you start condemning people, there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. So what you're saying, Pastor? I said there's a difference in telling somebody they're doing something wrong and condemning them. See, there's a difference. If I see somebody doing something that day, if I see somebody finna cheat on their wife, I'm going to tell them, hey, man, you shouldn't be cheating on your wife. That's wrong. I'm not condemning them. See the difference. I'm not condemning them. I'm saying this is wrong. When you start condemning people, you have just made yourself judge and jury. Because there is a way of doing it. If I drink this, all y'all going to go to hell. Now, I just did what? condemn them to where? Hell. That's not my job. No, no, no. That's not my job. My job is to stand up for what I believe in. And you know what I believe in? I'm not taking that. I'm not smoking that. And I can wait it out because I understand my principles to make it to heaven is far greater than any type of peer pressure. That's what this scripture is talking about. That's why I look at verse 20. It says, for meat, destroy not the work of God. That's why y'all ain't finna to pressure me into becoming a vegetarian. You must be crazy. <laughs> That's not going to happen. And it ain't, gonna, it ain't saying that because I'm, 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 I'm addicted to meat. I just like what I like. But guess what the Bible says, though? Anything that's not done in moderation is still wrong. Anything you become gluttonous in is still wrong. So does that mean I shouldn't take care of my body? Does that mean I shouldn't take care of my health? No, I got to take care of my health. Because look at what the other part of the scripture says. It says, for meat does not destroy the work of God. All things indeed are pure. But it is evil for a man who eateth with offense. So what does that mean? That means that no matter how much meat I love to eat, if I know you don't eat meat for whatever your reasons are, and I'm just <laughs> chomping down in your face or don't give you something, now I'm doing it with offense. That's that condemnation. Saints, there's a right, right way to live. And that's all these scriptures was talking about in the beginning. It was just talking about, look, everybody's faith isn't on the same level. So if I know that you're weak in an area, why would I ride down on your weak area? Or would I come down on your weak area? Or I'd be talking about your weak area. It's just like when people get up here behind this pulpit because they know they don't do something. Like, I know I don't cheat on my wife. I know I don't beat my wife at home. I know I don't have an extra family somewhere floating around. That requires too much emotional ties out of me. I got just enough for my family. <laughs> but if I get up here every week, right, every week, you shouldn't be cheating on your wives. You shouldn't have extra marital affairs. You shouldn't. You know what I'm really saying? I'm telling y'all to do the stuff that I'm not doing. I can ride down on that because guess what? It might not be nobody out there doing that. 
But guess what? Sometimes we as pastors get on that. We get on things that we don't do. And we just preach it into the ground. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't eat anything of the split hoof. Whatever. People who preach like that, though their word is sound doctrine, I'm not knocking them because they preach in that way. But most people who preach that way cannot tell you how to live your everyday life. You got to understand, I don't care how much Jesus you got on the inside of you, you still got to live this life. And if you're struggling in certain areas of your life, if you're struggling with communication in your marriage, or you struggling with the discipline of, the, of your kids, I'm telling you right now, it ain't a scripture in this book that's going to help you out. Oh, I could sit there and tell you, you got problems with your kids? Then the Bible says that if you beat them, you will spare their soul from hell. You might go home and beat your child for no reason. Chastisement. No, because true men of God, see, this is what people miss when it comes to Jesus. If you are a true man and true woman of God, then you'll be able to take these scriptures, no matter how many you know how to quote, and be able to put them in practical application in life. This ain't even my notes, but I'm here to tell you that is the glory of being saved. Because everybody don't read the Bible. That's why it's important for you to read the Bible. Not so you can memorize 15 scriptures, but you can remember to learn how to live in those scriptures. So then when I meet somebody that don't know how to live in it, I can take the scriptures and say, this is how you do it. That's why we live. This is why Jesus was such a master teacher. Because he knew how to take the scriptures and give them to people in such a way that their lives become better. And you know what that's going to take? Sometimes it's going to take you to be transparent. That's what Paul was saying. That's what Paul did. Paul was transparent. David was transparent. Chase, if you're not transparent, that don't mean you go around telling all your business either. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'm not telling you that. You know, if, if you got locked up for rape, uh, I don't know if you really want to get up and give that testimony. Oh, uh, saints, I would like to thank God for saving me because I was in prison for 10 years because I raped somebody. And, you know, because I raped them, God has delivered that spirit from me. You might get two amens. But I guarantee you, you come to church next week, you'll be sitting on that row all by yourself. We human. We human. But let me tell you the flip side of that. This is why as a church, we have to be a resource. Because we may get somebody who was in prison for 10 years that raped somebody. We may have to have a special support group. That can meet maybe not at the church because if they meet at the church on Wednesdays at four o'clock, you know, that's the rape support group. So let me see who's in there. Yep. Oh, I look, I knew something was up with that sister right there. I knew something was going on with that brother. I could feel it in my spirit. That's why we need discretion. But you see how we act as church people. I know this ain't a popular message, but I just got to tell you the truth in the sense of you don't want to be a dead man walking. Because just because you're not doing certain things, that don't mean you are all clear and free. We all got some things that we can be better at. Notice I said better at. I didn't say wrong. Because I'm telling you right now, if you think you are where you're at and you're comfortable there, you are already falling. Because in this life of Christ, you, we got to continually grow. We got to continually to get better. Now, let's look at verse 22. Hath thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Sometimes it's only you and God that know the strength of your faith. People, That's why the Bible says when you fast, you fast, you know, alone. You don't got to be broadcasting everybody. Hey, I'm on a 90-day fast. No, you ain't got to broadcast. And now there's some people you may tell. 
or if God using you to tell a story or a testimony, you may have to bring it out. But on average, we ain't sitting up here broadcasting. You know, oh yeah, we broadcast. We have church fast is on Monday. And we assume everybody's going to fast. But I can tell you now, I ain't never called nobody and said, hey, you fast today? Check. You know? I don't be at work. Uh, today is a fast day, so let me check out Facebook, see where everybody at. <laughs> you, you understand? I, I ain't got that kind of time. I don't. Because your faith is between you and God. Yes, we put it out there. But how you live your life, that's between you and God. You got to give an account to him, not me. No. But look at what it says. Have it that says, happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith. Now, here's the most important part. For whatsoever is not of faith is what? I don't commit adultery. I don't lie. I don't have hatred in my heart. Well, has there ever been a time in your life where you lack faith? Well, this one time, bam! See, just because you say that don't give you a carte blanc, that's not even a card no more, but that just means that, that I think it was replaced by the black card. You know, where you can just got, that was a credit card called carte blanc. Well, if you went to stores, you just swipe it and get whatever you want. Yeah, but a lot of us as Christians, we think that way. But I'm here just telling you a scripture right now that any time you've lived your life and you didn't have faith in what God can do, you sin. Lord, forgive me. That's why we can't get comfortable in this salvation. Dead man walking. I've been saved, pastor, for 20 years. That's great. Hope you make it to the 21st. But anytime you think there's nothing wrong in your life, I owe you a slipping. That is a slippery slope. And I just gave you one. For whatsoever, not of faith, is sin. And I'm here to tell you, if you've lived this earth in your flesh, and you have a desire, to be more than then you face that mountain of doubt Lord is this really you Lord I know you telling me to quit my job and you telling me to do this or go here but Lord how am I going to be able to provide for my family well Lord if you got me doing this when am I going to be able to spend time with my family Lord if you want me to do this Lord, they, they bigger than I am. Lord, you want me to do this? I, I'm not qualified to do this. Lord, I'm not the pastor. I'm not the bishop. I'm not the apostle. I'm not these things. Anytime you want to grow in God, you're going to face that mountain. You're going to face it. And either A, you're going to be like Moses and go up the mountain. Noah landed on the mountain. Abraham walked up the mountain. Or you can sit there and ask questions. Anytime you don't have faith, that's a sin. And that applies to Christians. You know how I know it applies to Christians? Because he wrote this to the church in Rome. He did not write this to the unsaved people. This is not unsaved people he was talking to. These were saved people that he was talking to, trying to encourage them. It's okay. Hold on. I know it looks dark, but God got a light on the inside of you that's going to shine beyond all darkness. God is a good God. Keep your faith. Keep your faith, dead man walking. Any saint that don't have faith, or you doubt it, or you lack faith, dead man walking. I, I can give you many stories of Peter. Peter was walking, Lord, if this is you, you know how we pump out. Lord, if this is you, bid me to come out. And what did Jesus say? Come on. And Peter went to walking. And he was walking. And the waters got a little rough. And he doubted. And what happened when he doubted? 
<laughs> Start drunk. They say that's the most painful death you can experience. I don't know. I won't tell you what I read. But either way, that's what happened to Peter. But Jesus, our Savior, reached down and brought him up. Anything not of faith is sin. Sin is the only thing that can destroy you. Lack of faith is sin. And it can what? Destroy you. Let us go to another scripture. Let us go to Romans chapter 6. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. So flip over. Romans chapter 6. We're going to read three verses. Starting at verse 3. When you have it, say amen. So what it says is this. Know ye not that so many of us was baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up by, from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we shall walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be what? In the likeness in his resurrection. Think about it. Saints, there are going to be some times in your life that you're going to fail. But walk in the newness of life. Walk in the new. You know what makes great people great? They forget about their mistakes. <laughs> they do. Think about anything you like. Basketball shooter. They, they, they shoot. Michael Jordan don't think about the shot he missed. You know what he's thinking about? The next shot he going to make. Kobe Bryant was notorious for that. That joke will be gunning. He don't care about the ones he missed. He care about the ones he make. You can eat this football season. Brett Favre, Peyton Manning, them guys. In order to be great, you can't focus on what you fail at. You got to focus on what you're good at and what you're successful at. And if you are a child of God, then greatness rests on the inside of you. You just can't be a dead man walking. You got to learn how to ask for forgiveness, learn what sin is to you. Because I can tell you what sin is to everybody else. Once you get past the works of the flesh in Galatians, then the Bible become a blur. That's why most Christians measure their salvation up against tangible things. Like smoking, drinking, and fornication, and stealing, and murder. That's why the Ten Commandments carry such weight, because it's t those are tangible things. But once you become a true child of God, baptized in the name, filled with his precious gift of the Holy Ghost, then your sins becomes intangible. It's all spiritual. So you got to learn yourself from a spiritual standpoint. That's why I said if you're still wrestling with physical things, you got a long ways to go. We're here to help you, but you want to get to the spiritual matter because faith is not physical. Faith is spiritual. This is why you can't go off of everything people say. That's why the Bible says you can tell a tree by the fruit that it what? Bear. You ever met somebody who's always talking, always got a plan? Man, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I got this in the work. I got this. I'm doing this. And you be sitting there like, wow, look, now don't y'all speak for yourself. I speak for me. Sometimes I be listening to people and I be doubting myself. I'm like, man, they got all of that going on. Man, where am I falling short? Only to find out. <laughs> Only to find out. They ain't got it. That's why the one thing I can always tell you about is consistency. That's why, you know, I, when uh, I was talking to the media, and, and, you know, it was about a few months ago, a few, four months, she was telling me, hey, Pastor, we need to get on Periscope. I researched Periscope, and that was the latest and the greatest thing. But the only reason I never really got on Periscope because I knew I couldn't maintain it. I knew my schedule did not allow me 
to be on there with the consistency that it takes to make a difference. When, because I was not in Periscope. Then the flip side of it was, man, oh man, in order for us to be on Periscope, we got to do this, 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 and this. I'm like, no. Don't ever be that person known to start something and don't finish it. Don't ever be that person. You start it, you finish it. Because when you finish it, you give God the glory. I don't care if you started your degree 19 years ago, especially those of us that's been in the military and you've been on a ship. You done took somebody class. I didn't call them pace courses. If you took one class, you started. And you might be 50, 60, 70 years old. Finish and give God the glory. You want to know why? Because the hardest thing to do is to finish something. That's why people take stock in results. Saints, if you don't get nothing else from this Bible class, get this. You should always be result oriented. When people see you, they should see results. If you say you're going to do something, you do it. And if you can't do it to the best of your ability and you already committed to it, you keep on trucking. Yeah, it might get difficult. And be honest about it. Look, I'm sorry. Look, man, it just got too tough, but I'm going to finish. Be result-oriented. You want to know why? Because you wouldn't have no salvation if Jesus wasn't a result-oriented follower. He was result-oriented, and he got the glory. The Garden of Gethsemane is one of the most saddest prayers. It's so sad to me. And the reason it's so sad, because when you think about Christ, you think about him in his infinite glory. You think about him in his majesty. You think about him in his all power. But as I sit there and I read, I think it's John 17, and I sit there and I read that prayer, it hurts me because I'm like, Lord, if you are God in the flesh and you said, let this cup pass, that's some agony. That's some pain. But he's toughing it out. Even when he was walking to Galgotha, he failed. And what happened? Simon, take the net and help him out. That's just showing you that I don't have all the strength in the world. Because if Jesus needed help, guess what? I'm going to need help too. So saints, don't quit. Be result-oriented. Be result-oriented. Because if you're not, then guess what? You're going to be dead in your walk. And that's what this scripture is telling us. That yes, so many of us was baptized into Christ, but we was also baptized in his death. And when you are baptized into his death, you are also baptized in the things that come along with the death. Those are the things that get us tripped up. So many of us want to be saved. Lord, please bless me, grow me. You know, what was that about four or five, maybe even ten years ago? Had everybody running? Ah, prayer your best. Pray at everybody running. Man, pe- pastors making millions of dollars. Prayer at your best. I'm not knocking the prayer at your best. I'm just telling you it was a fad. Had everybody running around here praying, talking about enlarge my territory. Enlarge my territory. And a lot of people got their territory enlarged. And five years later, the territory that was enlarged was taken away. You better be careful what you pray for. Because sometimes God will give you some stuff just because you ask. He already knows you can't handle it. That's why consistency. You show God consistency, he'll continue to grow you. Yeah, he'll continue to grow you. I be asking, Lord, where's my niche? I be trying to find a niche. Rick Warren became a millionaire. 18 million times over. I went to his church. Man, that's a nice church, too. Man, they they, they, they kitchen area is nicer than most churches. All because he had a relationship with God and was telling people about a purpose-driven life. Joel Osteen. All this dude did was get in front of a camera, smile. I don't know if that's his real hair or not. (laughs) This is my Bible. I shall do what it says it shall do. I shall do. But he looked at people and smiled and said, this is your day. Like, what? This dude sold millions and millions of books telling people, this is your day. Now, a lot of pastors preach against them. And I'm not telling you all these people 
are right. I'm not telling you all these people is, 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 is with the right doctrine. I'm not telling you all of that. But here's what I'm saying to you. Find your niche. I want people to talk about me. Hey, that Pastor Oliver ain't right. If they saying I ain't right, I must be doing something. Because people don't talk about people that ain't important. <laughs> That's just the bottom line. We got to be known for winning souls to Christ. That's why I don't talk against mega preachers. I don't. I'm not telling you they are right. But what I reason I don't do it is because if God bestow mega status on a little old preacher like me, somebody going to be talking about me. That's why I don't do it. I just look at principles. What principles did they use? Because you can't tell me if they packing out their church with 30 and 40,000, at least 10 of them saved. If I got to pack out 50,000 people for five people to get saved, I'll take it. Because being small, if you got 20 people and everybody in the church saved, then we start saying dumb stuff. Well, if this all God gave me to pastor. I just accept that, man. The devil is a lie. What I'm saying to you, I'm not striving to be mega. I'm just not putting any limits on God. And I'm using myself as an example as a pastor. But the reason I'm using myself as an example as a pastor is because I want you to look at yourself. Don't put no limits on who you are. Because there are people that are doing what you want to do. And if you're looking at them talking about they've made it the wrong way, you already putting limits on yourself. Oprah going to die. Hate to tell people Oprah going to die one day. Somebody got to take her place. It could be you. Well, you know, <laughs> I don't want to deny God. <laughs> so I don't, <laughs> the devil is a lie. Because I can tell you right now. Let me ask you this question. I know this is about dead man walking, but let me ask you a question. Did Joseph deny God? It's easy to say, no, he didn't deny God, right? No, Joseph didn't deny God. But let me, get you, let me put your mind in a biblical story and bring it forth to today. Did Joseph deny God? The easy answer to that is no. But here's what I want you to think about. Joseph's brothers walked up to Joseph and didn't recognize him. Think about that for a moment. Some of you guys, like today, today is my brother's birthday. I sent him a text. I'm going to call him tomorrow. All right? Today is his birthday. He's 45 years old. Is he 45? 44. He's 44 years old. It's been about five to six years since I've physically seen him. I've seen pictures and things, but schedule's different on this side. But he know I love him and he know I can promise you this though. I can go another 40 years and never see my brother. But when I walk up to him on that 41st year, I know that's my brother. So why didn't they recognize Joseph? You know why they didn't recognize Joseph? Because Joseph had a pen like the Egyptians. Joseph had one of them little ponytail thingamajiggers like the Egyptians. Joseph had on clothes and jewelry and them armbands like who? The Egyptians. Now get this. He was number two in charge. So he had to look as close to Pharaoh as he possibly could. So I ask you, did he really sell out God? You understand what I'm saying to you? Because today's standards, we would have been calling him a sellout. He's trying to look like the king. He's trying to walk like the king. He has become like the world. The only reason we know Joseph was a God-fearing man is because we read the end of the story. So what am I telling you, saints? You better quit worrying about people. And you better let your death tell your story. Because while you're going through the process, you're going to have a whole lot of naysayers. But if Joseph would have listened to people and did what people did, guess what? He wouldn't have saved the whole nation.
he saved the whole nation of Israel. See, it's easy to look at. You done heard many preachers preach that uh, message from the pit to the palace. I done heard that preached so many different ways. It's easy to look at these stories because we know the ending and believe in them. But what I'm telling you is this. They're writing your testament right now. Your life is being written right now. And there are people in your lives that don't like the way you look. And I'm not even talking racial. I'm talking about people in the church. They don't like the way you talk. They don't like the way you raise your family. They don't like the way you drive. They don't like the clothes you wear. You better not listen to people. You better have your faith in God. And you better listen to God. So at the end of the day, when they write your story, they'll be able to say, he was a God-fearing man or she was a God-fearing woman woman because that's the only way you're going to be able to tell your story is at the end that's why we can't get caught up in this mess everybody that God used had a relationship with him and they was humble before him in his sight and if we don't think that way then guess what we are a bunch of Christians who are dead men and women walking because you can't please everybody and everybody's not going to think the way you think. I got pastor friends, and I don't think the way all of them think. And some of them believe some stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's a little bit far-fetched. But if that's what you believe, I'm not going to knock you. It ain't, do you understand I have a hard enough time trying to live my life? I have a hard enough time trying to, to work fast, pray, love my wife. Love my kids. And I ain't even got to you all yet. <laughs> That's just my normal day. Then if I call myself a pastor, then I got to pray. I got to fast over each and every one of y'all. Then that, 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 Listen, that takes some stuff. You know that is enough for me to be worrying about what they doing down the street. That's why I don't get on Facebook saying a whole lot of stuff. I mostly use Facebook to try to make people laugh and share some things with my family. Very rarely do I get on Facebook and spread a message. You want to know why? Because that's the easiest thing to do in the world. I might put a picture or two that might have a significant meaning, but the closest I'm ever get to Facebook is when they live streaming right now. And you know why that's important to me? Because whether we were live streaming or not, this is what I'll be doing. I am not setting my schedule to be a Facebook preacher. Just don't work that way. I'm not knocking people who do it, but I'm just saying I'm not wired that way. Because God going to give me account for my own soul. Say, you're going to have to give an account for your own soul. Because if I ever put out a message on Facebook that's not like this setting, then I understand that I got to have the time to keep on doing it. Because you know how you all think. Oh, a pastor put out two messages on Facebook and then put nothing else out. Well, you know he was faking anyway. No. Remember I told you all. I Actually, I outdated myself. Black lives matter, green lives matter. What did I say? Give it two months. Give it two months and you'll see who the real people are. People who want to stand up for injustice. Give it two months. That's what you do. And then any of y'all time to get a new phone? And they're coming out with the Galaxy 7, the iPhone 9, and all these others. Give it three months. Wait three months. Then you ain't got to pay $500. You can get it for free. Buy one, get one free. Just wait this stuff out. Why? Because the true saints of God, if you're going to stand up for justice, you're going to stand up for justice. Not because of the color of somebody's skin. You're going to stand up for justice because that was just plain wrong. And we got to do something about it. Since this is why you can't get caught up in fads. I know we're talking about dead men walking, but you got to understand, getting caught up in the fads, you setting yourself up for failure. Anytime you can look at another person, another race, or another denomination, or somebody who don't believe or think the way you think, as a disdainment, then there's a problem. Do you know the power that's on the inside of you is greater? Listen, you 
baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, walk. That's the greatest way that you can spread the apostolic gospel. That's the greatest way you can spread the gospel of Christ. You want to know what spread is? Because guess what? When Jesus walked, people lives was changed. People was healed. People was delivered. People was fed. People was clothed. People was given shelter. All because of who he was. People was even raised from the dead. What's the point that I'm making to you? The best testimony or the best witness you can ever do is walk this life and change other people's lives. If your life, if your prayer life is all about what you got going on in your own prayer life or in your own world, you might want to check yourself. Because that's self-destruction. That means you ain't doing something right. That means God has given you some forms of liberty and you're not making the best time of those liberties. Let me read one more scripture. 1 Corinthians Chapter 15. Man, this time going by. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53. 4, 55, 56, 57. When you have it, say amen. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, And this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why it is so prevalent for you to wake up every morning with Jesus being your focal point. You have to. Saints, we are obligated to live a virtuous and a godly lifestyle. Because look at what it says. Only when corruption becomes incorruption, mortal become immortal, then and only then can you have victory over death. Then and only then. And what is the strength of death? It's sin. Saints, quit taking sin for granted. Just because you can quote 50 million scriptures, just because you can preach with the best of them, does not mean you don't take sin for granted. That just means you are very eloquent in portraying or putting out the word of God. That's all that means. And this is why you don't get caught up in other people's emotions because the Bible says that his word will not return unto him void. So I could bring my seven-year-old son up here, have him read a scripture and talk about it. Guess what? Somebody going to get something from it. You want to know why? Because it's the word of God. Most things that people call anointing is not even anointing anyway. It's the articulation of their words. The dramatization of how they present it. And then if you do it in a certain environment, then that becomes culture. Because most people have been trained to clap a certain way, jump a certain way, yell a certain way. And I'm not telling you they're wrong. Don't get me wrong. This is not about me saying they're wrong. I'm just trying to tell you, you best have your own relationship with God. So when the word moves you, it moves you the way you move. So, hey, let me see you get your shout on. Okay. Uh, I think the girls came back from Yaya and told me they had like an award for the best shouter or something like that. I was like, ooh, I should have been on that. I ain't been on Facebook in the last couple of days, but I saw this one thing, and I sent it to a couple of my pastor friends where this dude was walking around, passing the offering around. I guess he was shouting, but he was. 
I mean, he was popping and locking, and, and I'm like, what is he doing? And people, look, and here's the dumb part about this. Remember I said cultic. You know what cultic means, that you have a cult-like environment, meaning you have been brainwashed to think a certain way, and everybody in there think that way. And so the part that really got me was not the dude popping and locking and flipping and doing all that. I thought that was hilarious. What got me was the pastor and the other people. Because they was like, amen, glory. I'm like, what? Yeah, that, that got me. And I said, Lord, I got to be attentive because I can promise you all this. I'm telling you, I will not hold nothing against anybody who want to come up here and pop and lock and do all those different things. I don't know them, but I'm going to tell you what will happen. I'm going to look over there at the musician. <laughs> hey. And if he's still popping and locking and, and break dancing and doing the worm, call the deacon, get him. <laughs> oh, yeah, because come on now. The, the house of God is not to be made a mockery. And I'm not, notice, I'm not telling you popping and locking is a sinful. I'm just telling you there's always a manner of spirit in which things are done. That's why the Bible says that the spirit is subject to the prophet. So all I will be doing to Mr. Popper and Larkin is making that spirit subjective. Because I might have some other young people who think they can get up here and pop and lock and, and do all that craziness. All I'm saying to you, saints, is that I just tell you, according to the word of God, have your own relationship with God. If you want to get up and run around the church, run as fast as you can. Just don't trip and fall because Insurance might not cover it. If you just want to sit in your seat and just wave your hand, because God is moving, that's what you do. There is not a set way to give God praise and worship. You praise and worship God the way he designed you. You be thankful for the way he's treated you. And if you can do that, you will have the best relationship with God, and you won't even be worried about people. If you feel like yelling amen, just yell amen. It doesn't matter who else yells amen. You know, most people, they don't know, they, amen. You know, they look around to see who else. Everybody else going to yell amen. I'm going to tell you, don't do that here. Don't do it here. But when you go to another church, this is what I want y'all to do. I'm telling you. I'm telling y'all. So sit in the crowd. And the people preaching, whoever it is preaching, just stand up and see who else stand up with you. You know what I'm saying? Just say, or, or you just sitting there, do this. I see who else. No, I don't do that nowhere else. <laughs> but y'all understand what I'm saying. Ain't nothing wrong with those things, but whatever you do in the house of God, let it be because that's what you want to do. Because if it's what you want to do, you will never be embarrassed. You should never be embarrassed when you go to the house of God. And you're going to go to different other places. You're going to go to different other churches with different cultures. That's just the way life is. But you still be you in that culture. Don't put on, don't ever be afraid to be who you are in Christ. Because when you start doing that, you just become another dead man walking. God saved us to be individuals. We're just a bunch of individuals that is coming together for the team Jesus. That's what that is. Because each one of our individuality is important. This football season, you got 11 people. Nobody on those 11, on that 11, play the same position. Even though you may have two wide receivers, they run different routes. And that's the way the church is constructed, of different individuals. But we plan for the same team. Dead man walking. In order for us, in order for us to defeat Satan, we got to first learn how to put our flesh into subjection and develop a spiritual reality with Christ. A spiritual reality with Christ. And if you're not saved, then we got to get you saved. Got to get you saved. Ain't no salvation involved with this. That's your first step. 
Don't you worry, you don't want to be saved. You, know, you got to be saved. You got a key right over there. You got to follow you in the name of Jesus. Pray with you. Work with you. God give you the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you change the community. Thank you, God. Praise you. For change the community. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Uh, dead man walking like the saints.